and today's lesson is ecological studies. We're going to be continuing and this is our part two. Um, remember that we'll be using the CSEC syllabus as our guide. So we're going to be starting with cycles and we want to remember that cycles simply show how material moves through an ecosystem. And the three main elements that must move through an ecosystem are water, carbon, and nitrogen. So we're first going to be looking at the water cycle. So remember, cells are about 70 to 90 percent of water. So that means that our cells are really made up of mostly water. It's needed for important metabolic processes in the body. And it's important especially to land the creatures because of the risk of drying out. Now, the steps in the water cycle. So we're going to begin over here where we see the arrows moving from the oceans into the atmosphere. So evaporation. This is where we have water loss from the lakes, the rivers, and the ocean. So I want you guys to remember evaporation is simply the movement of water as a liquid to vapor. So liquid water to vapor is evaporation. Now once the water has evaporated, what we have is condensation occurring. Condensation occurs when the water vapor forms clouds. It forms clouds. And eventually, the clouds build up so much that they get so heavy with the water vapor that it begins to precipitate or what we call rainfall. So the water returns to earth as either sleet, rain, or snow. Now when the water returns to earth and it flows on the mountains and the land, we get what we call surface runoff, where there's a return of water to the bodies of the water or to ground water. Another important process not to forget is transpiration. This is another way in which water returns to the air. And this occurs in plants' leaves. So now that we've looked at the water cycle, we're going to move on to the carbon cycle. So leaves of plants take the carbon dioxide from the air and it uses the carbon in the carbon dioxide to form carbohydrates or starches. This is photosynthesis. This is how plants make their own food. The plants and animals also release carbon dioxide back into the air through respiration. And decomposers return carbon also to the environment through decomposition, where they feed on dead animals and plants and release the carbon stored in these animals and plants back to the environment. So now we're going to look at the nitrogen cycle. Now this is a cycle that most people don't take the time out to really understand. So we're going to go through it. Remember, nitrogen is needed by all organisms. It's used to make proteins and nucleic acids. And as we know, nucleic acids are needed to form DNA and RNA. That's the genetic material that makes us up. Air is actually made up of 80% nitrogen. So you see how important it is to understand how nitrogen is cycled throughout the environment? Only the cyanobacteria and rhizobium bacteria can use nitrogen directly from the air. And they do this through nitrogen fixation. Bacteria found in the soil and on the roots of legumes such as beans and peas also use nitrogen. So we're going to now go through the steps in the nitrogen cycle. We already spoke about the special bacteria, cyanobacteria and rhizobium, which are actually nitrogen-fixing bacteria. 
that take the nitrogen, the N2 gas, in the air and convert it into ammonia. We also have nitrifying bacteria in the soil that's just floating around in the soil waiting for the ammonia to convert now into nitrates. And we call this bacteria nitrifying bacteria. Plants can actually absorb and use these nitrates that are formed by the nitrifying bacteria to make proteins. And consumers will eat plants and get proteins that contain nitrogen. Now, when plants and animals die, Decomposers will break this, break down the dead organic matter and form nitrogen back in the air. So it breaks down the dead organic matter, releasing ammonia, and this ammonia is eventually returned to the air as nitrogen gas. And this process that the decomposers will undergo is called ammonification. Anaerobic bacteria in soil also releases nitrogen from nitrates into the air. And this is called denitrification. So, as you can see, the anaerobic bacteria, or sometimes we call it denitrifying bacteria, will release nitrogen into the air from the nitrates. So remember, we have the nitrogen-fixing bacteria that forms ammonia. Then ammonia is converted into nitrates by nitrifying bacteria. And then the nitrates is converted back to gaseous nitrogen in the soil by denitrifying bacteria. So we can look at other relationships within the ecosystem. For example, protection. So some species might depend on others for protection. Example, a grasshopper hiding in the long blades of a grass. Competition. So just like you have a sports competition, you can have competition within an ecosystem among members of the same or, the, or a different species for food, shelter, space, meat, or light. Pathogen. So a pathogen is any organism that causes disease. This can be a bacterial, a virus, a fungi, but it's any organism that causes disease. Camouflage. So if you've ever watched a war movie and you see the soldiers in their camouflage outfit in the green and you see them hiding in bushes and in the forest, it, it allows them to have an advantage. Or it allows them to remain undetected by their opponent. Right, so similar in, in the ecosystem, in natural environments, you have organisms that will try to camouflage or blend into their environments so that predators do not see them, so that they won't be hunted. So it's the same thing. Some organisms will just resemble their environment just for concealment. Pollination. So many flowers will depend on insects for pollination. And you'll find that these flowers tend to be very brightly colored and sweet to attract insects. So if you ever put a toy in front of a baby, you'll find that they tend to look at the toy that's more brightly colored, has lights, and that's just because it attracts them more quickly. So it's the same thing in natural environment. The flowers tend to the right the color, the yellow, orange, red, to attract these insects, bees, butterflies to them so that they can help in pollination, that is the movement of the pollen. So predator versus prey. Now, the predator is the animal that stalks and kills another animal. And the animal that it kills is known as the prey. And this is typically for food. Now, when you're looking at a predator, there are certain characteristics they tend to have. Sharp teeth, they're able to move very quickly, they have highly developed senses. And when you're looking at prey, they also tend to have sharp senses so that they can detect danger very quickly. They have very rapid reactions. 
and often they can camouflage. And remember, we spoke about camouflaging and how it can be used by prey to hide from predators. They also tend to have very protective body coverings and they tend to mimic poisonous species. So let's look at this image over here. Would you consider this animal, just based on the image and the characteristics you can see, a predator or a prey? And I want you guys to give reasons. So if you said predators, you're correct. So cheetahs are predators because they hunt other animals. And you can look in the picture and see that they have very sharp, piercing teeth that allows them to dig very deep into the flesh of their prey. They are able to move rapidly. In fact, cheetahs are actually one of the fastest animals in the world and they have excellent senses for hunting. Would you consider this animal a predator or a prey? And I want you to once again give reasons for your answer. So rabbits are typically prey animals. Many wild animals hunt rabbits. For example, foxes, cats, dogs, raccoons, hawks, they tend to camouflage in their surroundings. And as we mentioned already, prey animals, this is very characteristic of prey animals, camouflaging in their surroundings to basically hide from their predators. If you've ever had a rabbit as a pet, you know that they have very rapid reaction and sharp senses. They can tell when you're coming. You just see the ears go up and they're looking in your direction. So symbiosis is any close relationship between two different species of living organisms. Now we can look at the first symbiotic relationship, parasitism. And as the word suggests, there's a parasite and there's a host. So one species, the parasite, gains benefit while the other, the host, is harmed, whether it may be for food, shelter, or just protection. Some parasites can have an associated vector. So we're going to look at some examples. The tapeworm in humans. So the tapeworm actually lives in the human intestines and it absorbs digested food. So the infected person normally suffers from a loss of appetite. So imagine you're eating food and you find that you're still hungry. That's because the tapeworm is basically eating all the food that you're ingesting. So they tend to have abdominal pains, loss of weight, and they feel nauseous. The intermediate host is usually the pig. So we can also look at the malaria parasite in human, with its vector being the Anopheles mosquito. So the plasmodium or the malaria par parasite lives and reproduces inside the human red blood cells after an initial period of reproduction in the liver. As the red blood cells burst, releasing the parasites, normally the person develops a very high fever. The fever eventually will subside as the parasite enters more red blood cells and recurs as these cells burst. So the cycle continues resulting in a recurrent fever every two to three days. In this case, as we said, the vector is the Anopheles mosquito, meaning the Anopheles mosquito carries the malaria parasite. So when the mosquito bites the human, it can release the malaria parasite into the bloodstream. Commensalism. So one species, which is the commensal, gains benefit, and the other species neither gains or is harmed. So they're just basically there, just chilling, while the other species is basically gaining benefit. So we can look at a couple of examples, the cattle egret and the cow. So this is actually the egret, it's a type of bird, and what you find is the cattle egret, it perches on the cow's back and it gains food in the form of ticks and fleas from the cow's skin and insects disturbed by the cow as it moves through the grass. The remora and the shark. 
So the remora is just a small fish, which you can see right here. And the fish attaches itself to the shark by a suction cap on its head. And it basically gains food scraps left by the shark. And the last one we're going to look at is mutualism. This is where both species benefit. As the name suggests, mutual. We have a mutual agreement. Yeah, both of us, we're going to benefit. So sometimes they actually need each other to survive. The example we're going to look at is root nodules. So you find that nitrogen-fixing bacteria and the roots of leguminous plants, they have a symbiotic relationship where the bacteria lives in the swellings called the nodules on the roots. The bacteria gains carbohydrates produced by the plant during photosynthesis and protection. The plant now gains nitrogenous compounds as the bacteria fix the nitrogen in the soil. Some of my other examples of mutualistic relationships is coral and algae, termites and protozoas. So we're going to go through the mutualistic relationship between the coral polyps and the single-celled green algae. So this is actually just one coral polyp and we're going to zoom into that coral polyp and this is what we have over here. The zoom xanthalae is just an example of the algae and the algae live within the polyps tissues lining the digestive cavity. The polyps gain carbohydrates and oxygen as the algae photosynthesizes. The algae will gain carbon dioxide from the polyps respiration and nitrogenous compounds excreted by the polyps and protection. So as you can see, the coral will benefit in that they are obtaining the organic matter from the algae and the algae benefit because they are obtaining the carbon dioxide from the polyps respiration as well as protection. So we're going to go through 10 scenarios of symbiotic relationships and you're going to decide whether the relationship is a parasitism, mutualism or commensalism. The first scenario says, some shrimp and crab live and capture food from within the tentacles of giant anemones. So this is an example of a commensalism. So the shrimp and crab, they gain benefit in that they're able to have food, while the, the giant anemones, they're unharmed and they neither gain anything. So it's a commensalism relationship where only one person gains benefit and the other is unaffected. A pearl fish spends a day inside the alimentary canal or tract or intestines of a sea cucumber. The fish emerges from the sea cucumber at night to feed on small crustaceans. The pearl fish gets a safe place to live and the sea, cum sea cucumber does not gain anything from the relationship, nor is it harmed. So this is an example of commensalism, where one organism benefits, in this case the pearl fish gets a safe place to live, and the other organism, the sea cucumber, does not benefit, nor is it harmed. The third scenario. So we have an isopod living inside the mouth of a snapper fish. The isopod severs the blood vessels, meaning it cuts the blood vessels in the fish's tongue, causing the tongue to atrophy, meaning to get smaller and die. The isopod then hooks its legs to the base of the fish's tongue, essentially replacing the tongue, and it stays there for the rest of its life, feeding on blood, mucus, and stray pieces of food from the fish. We have a parasitic relationship. So the isopod is obviously the parasite in that it is harming the snapper fish by replacing its tongue and feeding on its blood and mucus. And the snapper fish is the host in that it is being harmed during the process. 
A box of crab carries a pair of small anemones in its claws. When approached by a predator, the crab waves the stinging tentacles of the anemones to deter the predator. The anemones benefit from the small particles of food dropped by the crab during feeding. This is a mutualistic relationship, meaning you have both organisms benefiting somehow. So you see that the, the box of crab gets protection from a predator by using the anemone's stinging tentacles, while the anemones benefit from the small particles of food dropped by the crab. So they're both benefiting. The fifth scenario, so we have a shrimp that digs and maintains a deep burrow. While underground, the shrimp is safe. Above ground, it is vulnerable to predators. Then we have a goby fish that lives in the burrow with the shrimp. The goby fish sits at the entrance, keeping watch for predators, and signals the shrimp with a flick of its tail when it is safe to come out. Or if a predator swims by, the goby darts into the burrow and the shrimp retreats further inside. These two animals are completely dependent on each other. The goby benefits by getting a burrow to live in and the shrimp knows when predators are near. The scenario basically gives you the answer. So this is a mutualistic relationship where both organisms are benefiting. Corals feed by the byproducts of the microscopic algae living within their own tissue called zooxanthellae. The photosynthetic relationship of the algae is vital to the survival of the coral animals, which uses the energy to extract calcium from the seawater and build their calcareous skeletons. The zooxanthellae are protected by the hard coral and obtain plant nutrients from the coral. This is a mutualistic relationship where both organisms are benefiting. Some species of barnacles attach themselves to sea turtles or whales. As the whales or sea turtles travel, the barnacles gain access to food in nutrient-rich waters. Their host neither benefits nor is harmed by its riders. This is a commensalism relationship. So you see that one organism is benefiting and the other one is neither benefiting nor harmed. So it's said that the barnacles attach themselves to the turtle or whales. However, the whales or the turtles, as they travel, they gain nothing from the barnacles. A tapeworm needs to eat food that is already digested. So it lives in the intestines of a dogfish shark and derives nourishment from the shark. As a result of the tapeworm infestation, the shark is weakened and more vulnerable to disease and predation. This is indeed a parasitic relationship. So the tapeworm being the parasite is feeding on the food in the shark's intestines. And during this process, the shark is becoming weakened and is therefore harmed during this process. So this is a parasitic relationship. Imperial shrimp attach themselves to sea cucumbers and get transported by their hosts to a large area of potential food with only a minimal expenditure of energy. They have been observed getting off their host cucumbers to feed in productive areas and then getting back on for a ride to the next spot. So this is a commensalistic relationship. The shrimp is the commensal in this case. They are benefiting. They're getting a free ride to their next food stop, while the sea cucumber is neither harmed nor benefiting in the process. All right, so we have lastly the tube worm found at the deep sea vents and cold seeps and has no digestive tract. It relies on symbiotic bacteria that live in the tubes, tube worm's tissue. The bacteria oxidizes hydrogen sulfide, or methane, for the worm. So this is an example of a mutualistic relationship in which both organisms are benefiting. So the tube worm relies on the symbiotic bacteria that is living in its own tissues 
because it has no digestive tract. So the bacteria is oxidizing the hydrogen, sulfide, and methane for the worm. The symbiotic bacteria is also benefiting in that it has somewhere to live. So I want you guys to comment your score out of 10. I want to see how well you guys did. And if you didn't get all right, that's fine. You just review the topic and you can come and review the questions again. So if you like this video, don't forget to share it with a friend, a classmate, and to subscribe to the channel. And don't forget also to now turn on your post notification bell so that you can get an alert every time I post a new lesson.